Good morning, everybody. This is a live severe weather briefing with another late evening severe weather event on tap uh, expected this evening across western Oklahoma and western Kansas, all the way down into northwestern Texas as well. And here you can see this uh, tr potent upper level trough that's beginning to eject. You can see all this cloud matter here uh, from the vorticity advection from the southerlies out ahead of this trough. You can see an elevated mix layer, this dry pocket of air that's marching across the desert southwest. Some dry air here as well coming out ahead of the trough uh, upstream uh, from the Mexican plateau. This is going to lead to some clearing as well across western Oklahoma. And uh, this uh, moisture advection is actually happening much more rapidly than especially the HRRR uh, was depicting. Uh, the three kilometer NAM here definitely uh, has, a best, uh, has the best handle on the moisture. But you can see upper 60s dew points here reaching up to the I-40 corridor. There is some cloud cover, but there's also some clearing. Look at that down near Frederick, Wichita Falls, already into the upper 70s down there uh, near the Red River. Uh, those are some pretty uh, deep dew points as well, uh, uh, much greater than many of the models uh, we're forecasting, uh, the exception being the three-kilometer NAM that seems to have uh, the best handle on this setup. But there you can see the big-time moisture infection happening. It's already reaching 70 along I-40 where there is quite a bit of uh, cloud cover, quite a bit of cloud cover here in central Oklahoma with a rapid moisture advection happening. But you could definitely see this inst instability axis, moisture axis here, upper 60s dew points all the way up through western Oklahoma. The nose of that moisture just starting to nose into northwestern Oklahoma with gauge clear 71 over 62, but that deeper moisture just about to arrive. So I have to decide whether to blast west on 40 or head northwest toward northwestern Oklahoma, even the eastern Oklahoma panhandle up there. Some of the better parameters uh, are associated with that nose at about uh, 0Z, it appears. Uh, here is uh, the 3-kilometer NAM, 12Z, uh, which is the uh, latest uh, run. And uh, there you can see it has convective initiation in northwestern Oklahoma out of the northeastern Texas panhandle, maybe near the Canadian area uh, toward Laverne. My gut says to play the southern mode, play I-40 off to the west, because that's where the deeper moisture is streaming northward from that direction. But also the nose, uh, the models are definitely uh, very consistent uh, with the uh, most favorable parameters up here, northwestern Oklahoma into southwestern Kansas. But then this whole convective line beginning to expand. So this is at 0Z here, where the 3-kilometer NAM shows that convective initiation near the nose. And you can see a 50-knot low-level jet. Oftentimes, the convective initiation will happen just on the south side of that strongest low-level jet there. And that's exactly what happens uh, with uh, those storms initiating out of the uh, northeast Texas panhandle. And just for to uh, cut right to the chase due to time constraints, I am getting the Dominator 4 fixed right now. Uh, getting some new lug nuts there in that tire. But this is the significant tornado parameter for 0Z, which is 7 p.m., basically right at sunset, very close. Sunset's a little bit before 0Z uh, this time of year. Come on. There it is. Significant tornado parameter at 0Z. And, of course, those brighter colors there are obviously the better kinematic and thermodynamic environment, better combination of variables right up near the nose. Interestingly, it doesn't have as much uh, significant tornado parameter off to the south, just a little bit of mixing, a little bit less curvature uh, to a directional shear in the low levels. But up near the nose of that instability up here, far northwestern Oklahoma, northwest of Woodward up there near Laverne, that's a pretty prime environment for tornadoes right at about 0Z. So it's possible we're going to be in nocturnal chase mode once again. Here you can see in the sounding, that elevated mix layer when the green line gets a little bit further away from the red line. That's a dry pocket of air coming in in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. And that's associated with steeper lapse rates as well there and a lot of cape. Uh, definitely going to be an abundance of cape. And then there you can see that perfect photograph there. Southeasterly winds at about 10 knots. And then you ramp up, blow up to a 50-knot southerly wind right there. Uh, you have a lot of area here contained within that hodograph curve and the storm motion vector contributing to a lot of helicity. Critical angles are a lot more favorable out in this uh, environment as well. You do have a little bit of a shallow stable layer, a bit of a capping inversion uh, that might need to be overcome, but look at that directional shear down there as well. Southeasterly winds at the surface, southerly, 40, 50 knots, accelerating, a little bit of some veer back, veer action, which in my opinion is quite irrelevant out there. And uh, we can see how this environment evolves with time, going to about 9 p.m. All of these holes here are storms that are ongoing within this convective allowing model. 
And it shows the environment down into western Oklahoma becoming more favorable as well as you get a little bit later, just after sunset, 8, 9 p.m., down near the I-40 corridor. The convective initiation builds down through western Oklahoma time, starting first in the northern mode, northwestern Oklahoma, then building down toward the I-40 corridor along that Texas and Oklahoma border. Quite a bit of moisture streaming northward still uh, by this time, but the nose of that moisture surges all the way up to the Kansas-Oklahoma border there. Those are those upper 60s dew points. This is just after sunset as well. Uh, even some mid-60s reaching up into western Kansas. But that's a big pipe of moisture coming northward. Usually the nose of the moisture, northwestern Oklahoma would probably be the best target. It looks like everything is kind of converging toward northwestern Oklahoma. There's that surface low ejection here, basically an elongated north-south surface low. Look at these south, untainted southeasterly winds just pumping into the I-40 corridor by about 8, 9, 10 p.m. So late night down near the I-40 corridor is going to be dangerous, definitely. And these storms could march their way uh, right up uh, toward Oklahoma City late. Uh, that seems like we're getting the same song and dance here with these supercells evolving, uh, congealing into uh, MCS and then arriving near the Oklahoma City metro, still having tornado potential oftentimes when they do. So to look at the timing here, it looks like this line of storms is going to arrive here in the Oklahoma City metro by about midnight, even some uh, supercellular modes getting hinted at uh, down in the southern mode down here near the Red River, southwestern Oklahoma. You could easily get a supercell storm racing northeastward up that I-40 corridor uh, with that environment, even though there is a capping inversion with such favorable kinematics with these big systems like this. Wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of tornado warnings here with this mode coming out of southwestern Oklahoma near midnight, coming up toward the Oklahoma City area. Midnight, 1 a.m. it appears. That's when that's going to arrive near the uh, I-35 corridor. That's at 6Z, so very late, midnight, 1 a.m. That's when these are going to arrive in the Oklahoma City metro, mainly as a squall line. So the greater tornado potential definitely is off to the west out there, but plenty of mid-level cape or uh, mixed layer cape up there. But looking at the surface space cape, you definitely lose your surface space instability, start to lose it a little bit late. But with all this moisture advection, you still get some decent surface space instability, even though there is a capping inversion. Uh, those lapse rates aloft remain relatively steep with the ejection of that elevated mixed layer that we just saw on water vapor over this environment. So I do think that there is a chance of a squall line with embedded tornadic circulations approaching the uh, I-35 corridor that includes Oklahoma City by about midnight late. And uh, that's what we are going to be watching for with this setup. I hate using the HRRR, but we'll look at it anyway. Worthless model. And it, it's even over, over mixing the dew points on a setup like today. I mean, look at this, what it does down into western Oklahoma. Just a completely inaccurate depiction of the moisture scenario across western Oklahoma by the H. Triple R, which I assume is tuned for the Southern Plains. Should be a bit, but it seems to have this problem uniformly, except for certain convective environments, it may not. But uh, this H Triple R definitely has the favorable kinematics off to the north, mixes out the dew point off to the south. And just to show you the difference between these convective allowing models here, let's pull up the three kilometer NAM. And look at that much more favorable environment being indicated across western Oklahoma with continuous moisture transport from northern Texas, northwest Texas, up through western Oklahoma, up in the north, northwestern portion of the state. But it does look like up here, Woodward toward Laverne, even the eastern Oklahoma panhandle is the greatest likelihood for daytime initiation, about 6 to 7 p.m. up there, Canadian up into northwestern Oklahoma. It might end up bombing back to the south toward I-40 late and then chasing those storms toward the Oklahoma City metro. But that's my weather briefing. I had to make this one short and sweet. And uh, the reason being, I've got to get down and pick up Dominator 4 that is getting fixed right now in Norman here. Uh, They're able to pound out some of those wheel studs and um, uh, get some uh, get, get new studs in there for the back left tire. Also got an oil change as well, uh, which is good news. Keeping on top of that, got a new air filter. Uh, I'm gonna have to get a new transmission eventually in Dominator 4 as well, uh, but you know, that's just how it goes, being a storm chaser, life on the road. Uh, your vehicle is one of your main tools, so you got to keep it tuned up, keep it driving well, and keep it safe on the road for you and the other drivers out there.
Uh, but we were chasing with those three studs in uh, Missouri. Had to stop just about every 15 miles, make sure that they were tight. Uh, but thankfully, everything is okay now. Getting those new studs put in with the parts coming down from Oklahoma City. So we're about to head west here. Captain Vanover is in the area as well. And uh, we're going to be chasing this together. We're about to head west. And uh, once the vehicle is fixed, and then we'll go live. Uh, storm chase mode, trying to get that drone shot around a daytime tornado. As we're getting later and later in the seasonal cycle, it is getting a little bit more difficult. Definitely disappointed uh, with my chase in there, leaving the Chillicothe storm. Would have been on that Purden tornado there from close range, flying drones all around it. Uh, but you got to stand by your meteorological decisions sometimes when you drop south for other modes. Kind of lost my mojo a little bit these last two years, but over my 20-year career, I usually have hot streaks that'll last four or five years and then have a one to two year slump where I kind of make some bad decisions or get unlucky. And then I have another four to five year streak of good luck just seeing every tornado. So right now I'm just working through uh, the mental issues associated with missing these tornadoes. I'm used to it. It's kind of baked into storm chasing, missing tornadoes because it's such a crapshoot sometimes out there. But you gotta stand by your meteorological decisions. You gotta stand by the process of storm chasing Keep going up there. The hardest part sometimes is showing up. You got to show up every time. Never stop chasing, learning. Never stop learning out there. And eventually you'll find yourself within about three kilometers of the tornado. And that's really when my only skill set kicks in is about three kilometers from a tornado. That's when you'll start to see things happening, getting very close to tornadoes. That's kind of what I specialize in is close range assessment of storm structure from underneath the occlusion or the tornado genesis process timing the, the uh, individual cycles as well. And on uh, that Chillicothe day, we were gonna keep going north and gain visual of the storm and expect inspect it before blasting southeast as the whole system was ejecting. So kind of forced us into committing to the northern mode or the middle mode or southern one. And it ended up being the northern mode and the southern one that produced those damaging tornadoes. So my thoughts are definitely with the people of Missouri that sustained damage from Purden down to Fredericktown, that was an EF3 over towards St. Mary and then into Southern Illinois there, Chester, EF1 damage found, found throughout town. Definitely shows you that the size of the correlation drop or the debris getting lofted by the tornado as assessed by dual pole radar isn't necessarily correlated with uh, tornado vortex strength. And I think that there are a lot of fall colors too that were getting lofted up into the atmosphere. And hence you saw these big debris signatures uh, with these storms just sucking up those fall colors like a vacuum cleaner and transporting them all the way up to like 30, 40,000 feet sometimes. Uh, and uh, those uh, those are fall colors that are getting lofted by these big tornadoes and also damage too. So you definitely saw that compact debris signature into St. Mary showing more of a stovepipe type of tornado. But that one down near Fredericktown was a massive mega wedge down there. And uh, you could see that big bounded weak echo region and that one caused EF3 damage. Could even be upgraded from there, but I do think that the EF3 Damage seems like an accurate assessment uh, of that tornado. And uh, we could get more strong tornadoes tonight. Anytime you get a 60 knot low level jet, even if there is a little bit of a narrow layer of some stable air near the low levels, you've got to be prepared for strong, potentially violent tornadoes because usually when you get a 60 knot low level jet and tornadoes are happening, you're not going to get an outbreak of just a bunch of bird fart weak tornadoes, but actually stronger tornadoes as well. And that one up near Purden was a large tornado big massive cone tornado so it definitely was not a bird fart that was a strong tornado up there northwestern missouri working the arc of the northern mode and so my plan now i think we're going to head toward take the northwest passage up toward northwestern oklahoma into the eastern oklahoma panhandle but i'm going to continue to keep an eye on those conditions down near the i-40 corridor because that moisture is deeper off to the south as it's streaming northward through western oklahoma deeper moisture off to the south streaming north but usually the nose of those moisture returns uh, are the place that you want to target because that's the most favorable uh, coincidence of low level shear and thermodynamics. So thank you everybody for joining me for this weather report. And uh, thank you for joining us for our live storm chasing through the afternoon and overnight tonight. May push it all the way to the mid south tomorrow with another tornado threat, far southeastern Texas, Beaumont along the I-10 corridor, southern Louisiana, Lake Charles, east, same areas that were impacted by Hurricane Ida down into southeastern Louisiana as well. Need to keep an eye on that setup. So definitely could be some tornadoes tomorrow down in the Mid-South, and I might be chasing it. Never stop chasing.